Well, good morning, North Hills, and another happy Sunday to you. I miss you so much. I want to say that it's good to see you, even though I cannot see you, but I am excited to be here with you from your homes, ready to worship with you. So let's go ahead and sing together this morning. I was buried beneath my shame. since we've sung a hymn together. So we're going to sing one of my favorites. This is Amazing Grace. Let's sing this together. We're going to sing Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet. Saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas 
Dear God, Lord, we thank you that it is because of you that we do not carry the weight of the world, the weight of our sins, that it is because of you that we, we are free, that you take those burdens and you carry them for us. So God, we ask that we would just be willing to give whatever is on our heart, whatever burdens we're carrying over to you. And God, would we rest in the reassurance that you are always looking out for us, that you love us so much. We love you, Lord, and all of your people said, amen. Good morning, North Hills. Happy Sunday. Um, if you would like to connect and you haven't yet, please go on to our website, northhills.us slash connect and fill out a connection card there. And if you have prayer requests, we'd love to pray for you this week. Um, also, if you have giving, you can do that at our PO box, PO box 398, Rancho Cucamonga 91729. 
Um, and all those information will be on the, the screen as well. Uh, our backyard groups or hit our second week this past week, and they've been going well. Um, and it's not too late if you'd like to join one. We have two on Sunday evenings and one on Wednesday, which is a Zoom group. So if you're interested and you'd like to sign up for one of those, even one to go this evening, um, just send mark that in your connection card, and I'll reach out to you and get the information you need for that. And then our trunk or treat. Um, as you know, trunk or treat is actually one of our biggest ways we serve our neighborhood. Um, typically, um, people come from all around our church and, and join us. And this week year, we don't have our parking lot. And so um, we are doing something a little different. But I want to encourage you, before I get into that part of the announcement, to uh, think of ways to serve your neighbors um, during this time. It may just be uh, being a welcoming place or just checking in with families with kids or whatever, just to uh, serve your neighbors um, like we normally would with our trunk or treat, but um, think of a way to serve your neighbors right now. And so we're doing an alternative to trunk or treat since we don't have our, our tr uh, parking lot this year. And we have a few families who've signed up and are preparing trunks in their driveways and they're going to have activities. Um, and so at each house, there'll be candy and activities. And um, one of our activities is actually going to be preparing Thanksgiving cards for folks that are living in assisted living. And so um, if you would like to sign up for that, it's for kids who um, are either in preschool, elementary, or in our youth uh, ministry. Um, and we're looking for, uh, you can the whole family can come along. It's on Halloween, and it's going to be a little earlier than our normal. It's going to be from 3 to 4.30. So if you're a family who's trying to avoid contact with other folks and uh, crowds, we, you can get there and do that before any of that happens. And if you want a trunk or treat, you'll have plenty, or a trick or treat around your neighborhood, you'll have plenty of time afterwards. And so the, here's the big deal. If you're joining, want to join us in that, please RSVP by October 25th, October 25th. Um, and so, uh, so that we can get everything prepared for all the kids who will be joining us this year. And we are going to be following all the San Bernardino uh, County guidelines for uh, Halloween this year. And so if you, if you have any concerns about that, we will have that all taken care of as well. Now, I'd like to invite Brian uh, Miller up to do our Thanksgiving announcement. Hi, everyone. I'm Brian Miller. It's, it seems like it's been uh, forever since I've seen you guys. And actually, I'm not even seeing you because we're doing this by video. But uh, I'm here to talk about the Thanksgiving meals that we provide every year to families in need. Uh, yes, Thanksgiving. I know we're not even into Halloween yet. But uh, we're doing things a little bit differently this year, so we're going to be starting earlier and ending earlier this year, which means it's really going to be a challenge, but I'm sure that we can uh, meet this challenge. Again, we're partnering with the Northtown community of Rancho Cucamonga to provide uh, families in that community uh, with Thanksgiving meals. And the families in, in that um, community, there's approximately 300 of them, and they consist between four to six people in each of the families. And those families in that community is considered what we would call the working poor. They're hardworking people, but sometimes they just have to use their money to either buy food or sometimes they you know, have to skip food and purchase uh, uh, medicine and, and that sort of thing. And really, Thanksgiving dinner has always been considered a luxury for them. And this is our 12th year providing Thanksgiving meals to them. And our first year, we provided 83 families uh, with uh, Thanksgiving dinner. And the last three years, we've increased that number to 300 families, which is 100% of the residents of the Northtown community. So our goal, again, this year is to feed all 100% of the community. That's 300 families. And this year, we're going to do things a little bit different. Uh, we're going to give each family a $25 Stater Brothers gift card, and they're going to purchase their own meal. Um, this year. And in order for us to provide each family with a $25 gift card, uh, we need to raise $7,125. And if we raise the $7,125, we will feed between 1,200 and 1,800 people this year that otherwise wouldn't have a Thanksgiving meal. So it, we'd like donations. And if you can please uh, make checks payable to North Hills and mark Thanksgiving in the memo line, and then mail it to the church P.O. Box, to the church's P.O. Box. And we need the donations to, um, to be received by Sunday, November 15th. And that's when we need them to be received. So when you mail the donations, please uh, take into consideration the time that it takes for the post office to deliver, to deliver the mail. 
And also, this has been a tough year for everyone. So if you're listening to this right now and you've had a tough year uh, and you're in need, or if you have a family member or a neighbor or a friend that's in need, please let us know and we would be glad to provide you with the Stater Brothers gift card as well. Again, uh, our goal is $7,125, so we're not going to count down number of meals this year. We're going to count down towards our goal, our, our monetary goal of $7,125. And you can make, again, the checks are payable to North Hills, mark Thanksgiving in the memo line, and mail it to the church P.O. box. Thanks, and have a great week. Thank you, Brian. Well, as you know, we've been preaching through uh, the St. Francis's um, prayer. And so we're continuing that today, and Jim will be up here to preach on that in a moment. But before we do, I'd like us to say the prayer together. So if you'll join me, let's do that. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me show love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not see, so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, and it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Good morning, North Hills. Good to see you again this morning. I uh, hope all is well with you. As I was, uh, Jacob was doing the announcements about Trunk or Treat, um, our house actually is going to be one of the homes that it, you, the kids can stop by and so forth. And I have to tell you, my wife is so excited about doing this. Uh, it's getting a little crazy at my home right now with Halloween stuff. Uh, she's got all kinds of ideas and things going on, including goldfish and, you know, ping pong balls and jars and stuff like that. So anyway, she's excited. So I hope you will be a part of that and uh, come over and see us. So and speaking of Halloween, one of the things I think all of us have in common is fear. <laughs> uh, we all know what it, it's like to be afraid. We've all experienced that. We might not all be afraid of the same things in life. But we're all familiar with fear. And the other day, I was kind of roaming around on the internet and looking at some of the things that people are mostly afraid of. And, you know, of course, one of the number one things I saw was spiders. Uh, people got a lot of phobias out there, and I know I got a lot of phobias, but uh, arachnophobia seems to be uh, one of the things on most people's list, which made me feel kind of good because that's not actually a fear that I have, so, you know, so much. It's one of the fears in my family, I will tell you. And uh, but I actually am the spider killer in my house. And if you're alive right now, there are a lot of spiders going on that with the heat, the way that it is and so forth, they're all over the place. And so over the years, I've just become accustomed to going around at night, killing spiders and to the point now where I'm even like, I don't even care anymore. I just smash them with my bare hand, even the little black one with the, uh, the little hourglass on her belly. So I take great pleasure in killing those particular spiders. However, I do have a number of fears that or on this particular list, like the fear of snakes. I absolutely hate snakes. Fear of being alone. I don't really care for that too much because I can't stand myself. Here's my greatest fears, though, the fear of heights and fear of confined spaces. And so I thought, man, if somebody really wanted to torture me, all they would need to do is put me like in a glass coffin and launch it up in the air about 100 feet or so and just let me dangle up there. That'd probably kill me. Um, which is another fear on my list, which is death. Uh, supposedly, the greatest fear there is is public speaking, which I am currently doing to you right now, uh, which, it, which outranks death. I think public speaking is so-called number one fear. Death is number three, to which Jerry Seinfeld said more people would rather be the person in the casket than telling the stories about, you know, standing up and telling the stories about the person's life and so forth. We all got fears, you know, fear of needles, dogs, germs, all kinds of stuff. One of the fears, though, that I was curious about was something that we have as kids, but 
it kind of goes away as we grow older into adulthood. And that's the fear of the dark. As we all know, and parents especially know, a lot of times kids are afraid of the dark. They just don't, you know, we got to have nightlights and things to help them navigate their way through, through the dark periods of, of the night. And so, and, um, and so this is real common, of course, among children. Now, there's a big difference, by the way, between having fears and phobias. One can be pathological, another is just, you know, it's just normal. It's protective. But the fear of the dark, the, the word for it act, actually is nyctophobia, which I thought was a fun word, like nick at night. And, uh, and, and nycto in Greek actually means night. So there's this idea of you people having the fear of nighttime, which sometimes around this time of the year that happens. But like most fears, I think fear of the dark is connected to the fact that we're not in control. There's, there's this unknown that's going on that we don't, we may not be able to see, right? There, we have far less control in the dark. We don't know what's around the corner or who's in the room, could be monsters, stuff like that. And it's no wonder, of course, that this idea of darkness and dark and so forth is one of the more common metaphors used to describe moments when we feel dreadful or feel in danger or get hurt. We often use the word dark to describe somebody's mood. You know, that person's, man, they're in a dark place right now. Or we just use it to describe somebody's ignorance, where we say, uh, that guy's just in the dark. He's in the dark about everything. Or we use it to describe evil, where somebody does something that's really dark and sinister. In fact, we even identify a period in the world history as the Dark Ages, it's just kind of striking to me. A whole segment of hi human history is called the Dark Ages. Now it's more commonly referred to as the Middle Ages, but a lot of people refer to it as the Dark Ages. And here's my guess on this. I'm guessing, guessing the reasoning for calling, using darkness as a metaphor for ignorance or evil or unhappiness has a lot to do with the influence of Scripture. In the Bible, darkness is a way of describing is used as a way of describing moral depravity, uh, trouble, afflictions, punishment, gloom, chaos, evil, and sin. It's not a very uplifting term, we can say that. Now, if you're just joining us this morning for the first time on YouTube or you haven't been with us for, for a while, as Jacob mentioned, we are going through a prayer of one of Christianity's most popular saints, St. Saint Francis of Assisi. Francis had become legendary for uh, so many Christian virtues, like generosity. He was incredibly generous. He had a deep love for all things living and um, deep conviction for the teachings of Jesus and a huge passion for pursuing a close relationship with God. But Francis was born during the Dark Ages. During this period of time in European history when Things just felt like they were coming unraveled when it was just not going well. And I told you before how he was, he was born during what was called the Fifth Crusade out of eight crusades where the Christians of Europe tried to, you know, reconquer the Holy Land in Jerusalem. This was a period of time also when the church, the capital C church in Europe and its religious leaders uh, became strongly influenced by political powers and started doing their bidding. Francis also came on the scene just after the church, the big C church, if you will, split into two parts, the East and the West, where you have the Eastern Orthodox Church on one side and the Western Church, now known as the Roman Catholic Church, on the other side. And about a month after Francis was born, these two church sides, East and West, went to war against each other in the city of Constantinople. And that war is tragically referred to as the Massacre of the Latins. It was a gruesome event. It's hard for me to imagine Christians literally slaughtering each other in this time frame. These were dark times, dark times for the Christian faith. Now, the Dark Ages aren't just, I think, labeled dark because of, you know, bad things. There are also not a lot of recorded history from that time. But with this in mind, I think it makes St. Francis' prayer all the more significant. Now, I've told you I don't actually think St. Francis wrote this prayer, but I know 
that it, you can tell it's his spirit. It's clearly his desire for the will and the way of God. And today we're going to focus in on the sixth line in the prayer, which Jacob read, where there is darkness, light. You know, I was thinking, one of the most exciting moments in the life of any parent is the moment when uh, their child speaks for the first time, says their first word. I mean, just so exciting, right? And of course, it's even better if, the, if your child says mama or dada as the first word because mama and dada have worked so hard to try to get them to say mama or dada as the first word. And, it, and, and not just when we're kids are first words important. Even when we get older and go through life, man, the first thing out of our mouth sometimes is the most important thing of our day because we always encounter situations that require us to say, you know, the kind of the right thing at the right time. You know, we're, we, we, we have, maybe we have got a job interview, and man, we want to make sure we say the right thing when we get in there. Or we're going to go out on a date, and we want to make sure we say the right thing at that time. Or, or, you know, there's all kinds of situations where we're put in a moment where, man, the first thing out of our mouth better come out right, you know? And sometimes we even practice for long periods of times rehearsing our opening line to make sure that it's okay because we all know we don't get a second chance to make a first impression. So we want to get it right. Your opening line can make all the difference in the world. Some of you are married to a person who's sitting next to you right now just simply because you had a really clever opening line. In the Bible, God speaks for the very first time in the book of Genesis. Anybody want to guess as to what God's opening line was? What did God lead with when he first spoke? Did he say, hey, it's great to be with you tonight, or how are you doing, or where have you been all my life? What did he say? He said, let there be light. And there was, and it was good. Now, this isn't so much a statement that God says. It is a command. God's like, I want there to be light, and there was. And it's a necessary command because if you're familiar with the book of Genesis, the opening verse says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was this kind of formless void, and there was darkness covering the, the sea and the, and the face of the earth and so forth. So you've got this darkness going on. And so in that moment, God speaks light into existence. Now, I will confess to you, I am not exactly sure what it means by the light that he speaks into existence. It could very well be his presence that comes into the existence there. We know it's not the sun because it's not created till the fourth day. But we do know that light is important, so important, so necessary, in fact, that it's created on day one, and it's the very first words that God uses or comes out of God's mouth. Because without light, there's just darkness. Light, you know, is the, the antithesis of the darkness. It represents life, which is, of course, what Genesis is all about. The beginning of life. So anyway, after God creates this life, I love this. God said, God looks at the light and he gives it a rating. He like a you know, five-star rating. He's like, this is good, man. This light is really good. By the way, darkness, it gets no rating. It doesn't even get anything, nothing at all. And clearly you can see from this that God favors the light over the darkness. And then what God does to even show this even more, he separates the light from the darkness. Again, just declaring his preference for light. So this creation of light in Genesis 1, the separation of light from the darkness, sets into motion one of the major themes all throughout the Bible. And that is this, that God is light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. Now, I suppose we could assume in St. Francis' prayer, when we see the words, where there is darkness, you know, let us bring light, that it is a prayer about bringing forth the presence of God, the manifestation of God's character and goodness. It's, the prayer isn't just throwing out any kind of light. It is the light of God. By the way, this continues on in the Bible. If you're familiar at all with the Gospel of John and the opening chapter of John's Gospel, it echoes Genesis 1. And it, 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 it kind of tells the story a little differently, but this time focusing in on Jesus. And this is how John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5 reads. In the beginning, the Word already existed. 
The Word was with God. The Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. He created everything through him, or God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot extinguish it. Now, of course, this is a reference to Jesus. He is the light, and the darkness will never overcome him. And the Bible will go on to say, and John's gospel will go on to say, identify Jesus as the light of the world. So Jesus has come to bring light. Again, not just any light. He himself is the light. He brings the word to us, God's word, God's wisdom, God's character, God's plan. Now, of course, Jesus doesn't just do this on his, you know, just for the sake of bringing light into the word. He's clearly referencing back to Genesis where he is the bringer of light to all of the cosmos. And again, this would not, there would not need to be any of this light in the world if there is not darkness. Because you know, and I know, that the problem in our world today is not that there's too much light. The problem is that there's too much darkness. And the darkness is not imaginary. It is real. It is everywhere. Whether you recognize it or not, whether you see it or not, whether you experience it or not, whether you participate in it or not, the darkness is all around. It's everywhere. Now, sometimes, of course, we only see the darkness that bothers us or the darkness that we don't like. And sometimes people get really passionate about pointing out the darkness that they don't like. You've probably seen that in the news of late, right? Philip Yancey once said this. I love this. He says, Christians often get very angry towards others who sin differently than they do. It is really easy to develop poor judgment in terms of the darkness. Sometimes the hardest darkness to actually see is our own. One time Jesus encountered a blind man. This is recorded in John chapter 10. And, um, and the blind man had been blind since his birth. The disciples saw the blind man. They'd maybe even grown up with him, made, knew him or whatever. And everybody assumed, and the disciples assumed, that it, the guy was blind from birth because his parents must have done something wrong. His parents probably committed some kind of darkness. And so this kid is punished for the darkness that they did by living in darkness. It's really kind of the point there. And anyway, Jesus has to correct their misguided theology. And he basically says the man's blindness is not a curse to him. It just was what it was. It is what it is right here. And then Jesus comes along and he says this to me. He says, hey, while I'm here with you, Gaul, while I'm in this moment with everybody, while I'm in the world, I'm telling you I'm the light of the world. And so he's going to bring light into this moment, into this dark moment. This is a great story. I don't have time to read it because it's a long chapter, but you should go read it, John chapter 10. And what ends up happening, what Jesus does in this moment, he creates this like living metaphor to teach the people about light and darkness. And it's a great way of doing it. I mean, he, he literally uses a real person to teach his disciples, and not just his disciples, but everybody who's listening, especially the religious leaders who are paying attention to this moment. So anyway, this guy's born blind. And of course, blind and darkness, they kind of synonymous with one another. And, and, and they're sometimes used as, you know, getting things wrong. Well, anyway, Jesus, he says, I'm going to heal this guy. So he, what he does, and you may remember this story, he spits on the ground, makes a little mud pie or whatever, and then he puts it on the guy's eyes, which is very unique for Jesus to do. He often just said things to heal people or touch people, but this time he's using the earth to do this, the earth. Anyway, he gets the mud on the guy's eyes, and then he tells the guy, go, go wash it off. And eventually a guy washes it off, and he can see now. And here we have this moment where this guy is like, he, he literally says, like we, the song we just sung. I was blind, but now I see. Well, this happens, and everybody is shocked. And in particular, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, these people, they're shocked by this. 
Now, they've all along been disturbed by Jesus' teachings and his antics. They've quite frustrated him. And when they see that this man was once blind, but now he's looking them in the face and he knows what they look like, these guys fall off their bar stools and hit the floor. And they want to know exactly how did this go down? What happened? How were you blind? And now how do you see? And they tell, he tells them, man, this is a story. They, they're so concerned about this moment, they call in his parents, interrogate them. Was he really blind from birth and all this other stuff? They want to know. Then they, they, by the, and then eventually what happens, Jesus gets involved in this situation, and he ends up confronting the religious leaders. And he tells them this. He says, listen, my mission for being in this world is to give sight to the blind. Now, you could say, oh, yeah, he did it. He literally did it. And he literally did do it to, to this guy. He, he gave him his sight. But Jesus now is going far beyond just literal sight. And we all know this. And then he says to those re religious leaders, he says, I have also come into this world to show those who think they can see just how blind they really are. And then the religious leaders respond, are you talking about us? You talking about me? And I can just imagine Jesus saying something like, if the sunglasses fit and the white cane and the seeing eye dog, yeah, I'm talking about you. You are blind. And you got to imagine these religious leaders are like, come on, man. <laughs> Seriously? You're accusing us. The leaders of the faith the leaders of the temple, the leaders in the Torah, you're, you're telling us that we're blind. Seriously. And Jesus says, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Now, hang with me. I know this is kind of hard to hear, but hang with me for a minute. We're going to jump uh, backwards seven chapters to John chapter 3. If you're familiar with John 3.16, remember that? For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son to whatever believes in him will have eternal life, right? Right after Jesus says those words, he brings up this light and darkness thing again. And he says this to the people. You can, if you're keeping score, it's John 3, 19. He tells the people, he says, the light has come into the world. In other, in other words, he has come into the world. But then he gives this, he says, but people love the darkness more than they love the light. Now, that's a real, I don't know, confrontational statement, I would say. People love the darkness more than they love the light? Really? Could Jesus be like, you know, overstating it maybe a little bit? I mean, seriously? I mean, how about you? Do you really love the darkness more than you love the light? What, what is he getting at here? My guess is most people would never ad actually admit to loving darkness over light. In fact, most people would never admit to loving darkness. I mean, we, we don't want to sound that psychopath, you know, that whatever. But most of us would say we love light more than we love darkness. But then maybe we're just not quite aware of what we really love. And maybe this is where Jesus is trying to, you know, help us see. If you're if, in the country of South Africa, a long time ago, between the early 1900s to 1990s, there was a system of racial segregation that had begun there. Anybody remember what the system was called? It's come up on the screen here. It's called, it was called apartheid. Right? And I want you just for a minute, just pause for a second and just look at that word, apartheid. I mean, just look at look at how it just sound it out for a second. It's three syllables. A part height. What does it sound like? It sounds like, well, I'll tell you, in English we would say aparthood. That's what it means. Kind of like you live in a neighborhood, right? Well, this is a part hood. 
better, a better definition might be a partness. And this was the system that was created in South Africa where you take people and you create a system, a government system that pulls them apart, separates them apart from one another, where they live literally apart from each other. And it was a system of governance, as you well know, that favored white South Africans over black South Africans. It ensured that South Africa would be dominated politically and socially and economically by the nation's white minority. They were the ones who had the power. And they would create this system to separate themselves from their fellow South Africans who were of a different color than them. Anyway, I tell you this story because a long time ago, I was with a group of people, and pastors mostly, and uh, one pastor in the group had grown up in South Africa. And so he started talking about how he'd grown up during this time of apartheid. And he knew, even as a pastor, it's probably not a good system to have. He knew it wasn't quite fair and so forth. But he'd grown up in it so much so that he'd just come to embrace it just as a way of life. He figured it doesn't really affect me all that much, so he thought. He knew it wasn't quite fair, but he never, ever, ever thought of it as darkness or evil or sinful or unjust. He was blind to it. He was just, he didn't even see it. Then one day, why the light went on, and he never saw it the same again. He was blind, but now he sees. And that same dynamic that sustained apartheid for years and decades happens to us in all sorts of other ways. We become blind to things we don't see anymore. The gossip, the greed, the hatred, the envy, the laziness, the pride, the lust, and so on and so forth. We become so used to our darkness and so even familiar with its destructiveness that it's just normal to us. It's just a part of life. So am I saying we are blind? John Ortberg puts it this way. Trying to see the truth about ourselves is like trying to see the inside of our own eyeballs. Try to do that sometime. Or the psalmist puts it a little differently, I think quite significantly. Who can discern their own wrongs? Now, I've told you throughout this series that this prayer that we've been praying, this prayer of St. Francis, is known as a formation prayer. It's a prayer whose primary ambition is to change us, to help us see, so that then we can help, we can help to bring change in the world in which we live. And so what we have to do, of course, in the midst of all this, is we have to, we have to become more aware of our own darkness, even of our own blindness so that we can, in fact, see. We have to step into the light, walk in the light. Now, of course, in order to do this, we are going to have to expose ourselves to some serious light because as Martin Luther King Jr. pointed out one time, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. So we're going to need a lot of light for this. We're going to need the light of the world. Our darkness is literally a God-sized problem into which he wants to speak, let there be light. Some time ago, I heard a great line from a song that I, it has just stuck with me for decades now. It's by a guy named Bruce Coburn. And the line in the song goes like this. I'm going to kick the darkness until it bleeds daylight. I love that line. It just seems so defiant to me, and I just love the the idea of I'm just going to kick the darkness until it bleeds daylight. And here's the deal, folks. We cannot let darkness win. It can't. So we got to kick the darkness until the moment God calls us home or until the moment God makes all things new. We're not going to let it win. Jesus made this point to the disciples one day. 
And now those disciples, by the way, are us. This is Matthew 5, 14. And I'll read it and we'll just close with this. Jesus says to us, you all, you are the light of the world. I mean, he's calling us the same thing he's calling himself. You now are the light of the world. He go, then he goes, a town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your, your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Where there is darkness, why let us turn on the light. Will you join me in prayer? Lord, we are humbled at times to know that we don't always see ourselves clearly. That we think we're standing in the light when it's really dark. When we think we can see and we're actually blind. And Lord, we know that you have come to the world <laughs> to turn on the lights and to help us to see, to save us from our own selves. But not just to save us, but have us even do the work of being a light as well. And God, I pray that that is something that grabs us to the point where we say, now I'm going to be an advocate for the light of the world. I'm going to kick the darkness. Because that's my job. So Father, would you, your spirit empower us in this way, speak to us in this manner, and help us to this end. And we thank you, and we pray this in your name, Jesus, who are the light of the world. And everybody said, Amen. God be with you.